Okay, so this video is for AP Bio, topic 8.6, biodiversity. So let's go ahead and talk about the different components to biodiversity. First, we can talk about uh, diversity within a species. So that comes into play when we talk about like different alleles and genetic variation, which is something we really tried to focus on in like natural selection and unit seven. And as well as unit five and unit six, talking about different genes, dominant, recessive, alleles, etc. So when we talk about variation, though, within a species, the more genetic variation or the more genetic diversity that can exist within a population, that's going to like increase or add to the overall biodiversity of a, of a species or of an area. Um, we can think about right now as species uh, face extinction and are becoming endangered, scientists are working on like cloning species. Well, if you keep a population alive by cloning it, you're missing that genetic variation that's essential to the survival of a species. Um, another part of biodiversity would be species diversity which is where I had that video on uh, the Simpsons Diversity Index. And so species diversity has a couple parts. You have species richness as well as species evenness or like relative abundance. And so the amount of different species within an area as well as like are they pretty even in their distribution or proportions or, or is the community dominated by like one species? Right, that would be like a lowered biodiversity. And then the last part would be diversity between ecosystems. And as our world is undergoing changes with human population growth, habitat loss, climate change, uh, we may see some shifts in our ecosystem diversity as we lose um, important habitats such as like coral reefs or mangroves, uh, etc. All right, so let's go. Here's a picture of biomes. Okay, so let's go ahead though and talk about um, this standard here that says natural and artificial ecosystems with fewer component parts and with little diversity among the parts are often less resilient to changes in the environment. So here I have a picture of a crop, a cornfield, and so that would be an example of like an artificial ecosystem. This is what we call a monoculture where we have just one crop being grown and in this artificial ecosystem by having just one species of producer like that puts this uh, crop at great risk for maybe an invasive species to come and take over or like an introduced disease we can learn the lesson from the irish potato famine um you know <laughs> hundreds of years ago uh, that virus or a pathogen came and attacked their potato crop by growing only one crop that really set them up for um, disaster in reality. Uh, so anyway, when we talk about natural and artificial ecosystems, though, the greater the biodiversity, the more resilient the ecosystem is. Here, uh, if there's like a disturbance such as drought, or here's that like um, pathogen for the potato blight, or you have um, like an invasive species, the more diversity whether it's genetic diversity, species diversity, um, the more diversity within that region, within that ecosystem, is going to give it a greater advantage at handling and surviving disturbances, such as uh, human activity, pollution, habitat loss, drought, disease, etc., climate change. Okay, uh, then uh, we talk about here, keystone species. Producers and essential abiotic and biotic factors contribute to maintaining the diversity of an ecosystem. So uh, I actually talked quite a bit about um, the wolves of Yellowstone and sea otters as keystone species in my class. So it's not really here in my video, but um, a keystone species is a species that has a very large impact on a community uh, disproportionate to the amount of that individual or it, that individuals in the species. So, for example, I would recommend watching the cute little video on YouTube about the wolves of Yellowstone and how they change rivers. It's a perfect example of a keystone species and their ecological role. Now, sea otters are a keystone species. Um, their presence 
keeps the whole aquatic ecosystem in balance. For example, uh, sea otters eat sea urchins, and sea urchins basically clear if uh, they eat the bottom of like seaweed, basically, and kelp. So if you keep the urchin population in check, then the kelp forests are nice and healthy. And the kelp forest is a habitat for lots of different species. However, when sea otters have been hunted by humans um, to near extinction, as well as preyed upon by orcas in the 90s, both times in history that we've recorded of sea otter populations declining, that led to an increase in the urchin population and by an increase, like exponential growth of urchins that led to a decline in the kelp forests and therefore a huge disruption to um, the biodiversity of that area. So I would research both of those a little bit more if you would like some more info on keystone species. If I have time in my life, I may make a video about them, but for now, uh, that's my talk on keystone species. Um, anyway, and then as we move into uh, the producer aspect of this, so uh, the variety of producers that are, and the amount of primary producers in an ecosystem can help to maintain the diversity of the ecosystem. Since producers are the bottom of the food chain, the food web, they're essential to maintaining lots of trophic levels. If you have a reduction in the producers in an ecosystem, that's going to affect the herbivores followed by the carnivores, and it's going to disrupt the whole balance. So producers are essential to maintaining ecosystem diversity. And then for the part about abiotic and biotic factors, in my class I chose to show this video on um, wildebeest and how their matter cycles. So if you can find this video on YouTube, uh, I highly recommend it. It is um, a great example of why nutrients are important in maintaining ecosystems. Uh, now, let's go ahead though. This standard, to be honest, I wasn't incredibly sure how College Board wanted us to interpret it, um, but it says the diversity of species within an ecosystem may influence the organization of the ecosystem. Uh, so I have some pictures that I've taken throughout the last couple years of different ecosystems, and we can just envision um, the different amounts of trophic levels or species diversity that would be present in each of these. So here is some chaparral. This is actually a hot springs in California. And when we look at the diversity of species here, we see there's some plant diversity. We can imagine some rodents, some birds, some snakes, maybe some deer or mountain lions can be existing here uh, versus like Joshua Tree National Park, um, very hot and dry. So here um, you're going to have less biodiversity kind of with the amount of like a reduction in primary producers, especially if you can compare that to like here is um, Redwoods National Park. You can see my son in the blue down there. So you can see the massive size of the producer populations. And so this diversity within the Redwoods compared to Joshua Tree National Park, there's a huge difference in how the trophic levels would be structured, the amounts of like symbiotic relationships or the different predator-prey relationships happening, um, or even like competition for resources. In Joshua Tree, you're gonna see a great competition for like water. So what do the root systems look like underneath that soil? Versus in the Redwoods National Park here, there might be competition for space, right? It looks to me like all available soil has been taken. Um, now this is, if we talk about like Yosemite National Park, you can see how, um, again, lots of primary uh, producers, and so therefore you can imagine multiple trophic levels. Um, you have your like deers and your rodents and your beavers and your birds and your bears and your insects and your snakes, and so uh, lots of biodiversity can be supported in that ecosystem versus, I'm not sure which national park in Utah this is, if it's, um, I believe it might be Arches. National Park, but it also could be, um, I think it's Arches National Park. But here, if I look down at the plant uh, population, I can see just basically one species growing. There's probably a few others mixed in, but with this, you can imagine that there's going to be have lower amounts of species diversity due to the lack of diversity in the producer species. Uh, here we have, this is Olympic National Park up in Washington. And again, lots of primate producers, so you can imagine lots of insects, lots of uh, maybe rodents and reptiles and birds. 
so amphibians, so a lot more life can be supported uh, when you have greater amounts of plants. Now this is just in California on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevadas. And so you can see not a lot of plant biodiversity and you can imagine not a lot of uh, trophic levels or different species existing within that region. So uh, this brings us to our last slide about keystone species. So it says the effects of keystone species on the ecosystem are disproportionate relative to their abundance in the ecosystem. When they are removed from the ecosystem, the ecosystem often collapses. So this is what I was talking about with the sea otters earlier. If you remove sea otters from the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, you're going to have a whole collapse of the ecosystem. Their single presence in that region helps to keep the urchins in check because the sea otters are a density-dependent limiting factor for the urchins. And by keeping the urchins in check, this maintains the kelp forest. And the kelp forest is a habitat and a home to a wide diversity of species. So that one species, the sea otter, has a very large or disproportionate um, impact on this aquatic ecosystem. So they are the perfect example of a keystone species. All right, all right, great job.